Dobry den, I should say. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us here today. You know, I was sitting backstage just now, and I'm like looking at this gorgeous room that we are in. And I, you can see it really beautifully back there, what these angels are doing. They're playing musical instruments. And I think that that's really powerful. Because something like music, something that really is about connection, that really is the heart of education as well. We've heard a lot about technology. And of course, I won't be shy to talk about technology with you today. But I also took a couple of notes. You know, what would this audience really want to know? And Eva told me there are a lot of parents in the audience. They have children. They are thinking about what AI is going to do to the future of learning for their children. Is that, is that accurate by, by a show of hands? Yeah, of course. So I, I wanted to honor that. So I just took some notes, you know, education, it's deeply personal. We're going to touch on that. We're going to touch on mindset. You know, how do you want your kids to feel? And how do we stay connected in this extremely digital world that we're living in? I'm also going to share with you today a few ways to just think about learning, to just get right back down to the heart and the art of education. So AI and education is deeply personal. It's getting deeply personal. We are learning from algorithms that are learning from themselves. And that's really important for us to remember, because just last week alone, we had the introduction of Tesla bot. I'm sure you've seen it. It now also meditates, literally namaste, at the end of its movements. We also saw Microsoft's Copilot, which opens up a whole world of creativity and thinking that we might not have to do as we did before. We saw Voice GPT introduced, which was an extension of GPT-4 which some of you might be subscribed to. Now you can just speak to the AI very easily. And we saw BARD integrations. That's another large language model, which is now integrating across multiple functionalities as well. And for the parents and the teachers and the educators amongst us, there is a tool to undo the plagiarism tool. So where we were protecting our education system by thinking, well, let's just detect plagiarism, there's now a tool to undo that, which really means we have to rethink what we're teaching, what we're learning, and how we are assessing education today. So we're going to discuss a few practical applications of AI in education, ways to leverage AI, and how we actually work with AI companies to make it work for us. Why are we doing that? Well, because there's a range of skills that we need to know in the 21st century. And I learned many of these skills growing up in 15 countries, teaching in classrooms like this one in South Sudan right after the Civil War. So with that experience, I kind of manifested it and let it sit into my system, wrote a couple of books about it, and also consider on a larger scale, always through a zooming out approach, what is actually happening in education. So I just want to tell you a couple of things about it. Um, there's a couple of countries here that are worth just flagging in Singapore, very forward thinking, already often ranking very high on PISA, really doing well according to the international grading standards. Um, students work hard. And now a major initiative from the government is to make sure that digital tools are used well in the classrooms for students and for teachers. India is aiming to launch a free AI course for everybody, which I think is amazing, because that is a lot of people. So if India can do it, we must be able to do it. Um, in Japan, what is so beautiful about Japan is their moral-based education. 
So they really look at kids connecting based on empathy, based on values. So a values-based education. Letting an elderly person cross the street before you, for example. Something that, by the way, kids in the Netherlands could do a little bit more of, but what we do very well in the Netherlands is look at independence and really help kids take ownership of their own journeys. In fact, kids in the Netherlands uh, were almost at 100% rate of primary education, which as you, if you're parents or if you're an aunt or an uncle, um, you will know that those years are so critical for the brain, the early childhood development years. Finland has a very interesting approach where a lot of their learning is focused on project-based learning and play. So how are we playing together to innovate and to create? And South Korea is doing something really interesting as well, where by 2025, they want all their students to have an AI mentor, a personal teacher in the back pocket of every student. And why is that so cool? I'm putting this down. It's so, so pretty, right? But I'm just going to put it there for a second. Why is it so cool that they want to have these AI mentors for the kids? Because essentially, it takes away the need for a report card. Isn't it strange? that once a year or twice a year your teachers assess you and then on a piece of paper it says who you are and then that piece of paper dictates every single step you will make for the rest of your life? It's a bit strange. It is really taking the entire essence of a human being and making it subject to one form of grading. So this movement in South Korea is really interesting. If we look at the Czech Republic, your new minister, I understand that you most recently shuffled as well your cabinet. Um, you're really focusing on bringing AI to the Czech schools. And feel free to scan the QR codes if you'd like to learn more about these sources that I'm presenting to you today. Uh, you can do a little bit more reading about them as well. You also have DigiHavel, which was actually built a couple of years ago already, two years ago, and really looks at getting kids to learn civics where they can speak with AI and learn a more personalized form of content tailored to their learning needs. You also have PRG.AI, founded in 2019. So you see there's actually a lot going on here as well. I'm bringing up Finland again. They also had a free AI course. I'm sure you've heard of this. But what's interesting about this is that this is already a couple of years old. So what you see is that different countries are integrating these different approaches to artificial intelligence. Some are using it to upskill all the citizens in their countries, and others are just implementing it right into the schooling curricula immediately. South Korea, back again to the AI mentors. Feel free to scan this if you want to learn a little bit more about their strategy. And why do I say that? Because it's really good to learn from others, right? That is collective intelligence. In fact, when Adam was speaking about errors in medical care being the third biggest killer, I can tell you why that is. It's very often because in the operating room, when a nurse notices a mistake by a doctor, if that is not a good team where a nurse feels confident or comfortable enough to say, hey, I believe you are making a mistake or shouldn't we do this instead? That's when those mistakes happen. So what does that tell us? That tells us that things like communication, our relationship with our intuition and our instinct and our ability to have collective intelligence are absolutely key in this 21st century, especially because so much technology is coming our way. You've heard multiple times say already that this is a collaboration, that we are working with technology, and we can only do that by being better at being human. In the US, we see Khan Academy, which is developing an AI mentor as well, with which kids can engage and talk and teachers can use to do things like plan lessons. You may also be interested in UNESCO, which just released an update to the latest rules in learning. And they're really trying to protect the child when it comes to safe spaces in which to use digital tools. 
Let's just take this back for a second, right? Because we've been speaking about AI a lot today, but I always like to think of things in timelines. If we want to know where we're going, we need to know where, we're, where we've been. So what happened in Dartmouth in 1956 was like this summer workshop organized by Marvin Minsky, who was one of the authors we saw in an earlier talk as well and a couple of colleagues, and they said, you know what, we really have to get together and we have to think about how we can make machines, you know, use language. Why don't we also look at how machines can form abstractions and concepts? And finally, you know what would be really cool? If we found a way to make machines improve. So if anything about what I've just said stands out to you, it should be that third point, making machines improve. Because that's the essence of what we've been talking about today. That's where the change is happening so fast. And that's how we end up with really creepy things like this. And I, I know this is like two, three years old, but it creeps me out. I really would prefer a robot that does yoga. Um, so when we have things like this, it, it starts to really Pick, make us think about, wow, well, how, do we, how do we put into context all this exponential technology out there? So let's break it down. Let's remember where we came from. 1815, Ada Lovelace was writing in her journal her seventh set of notes, to be precise, where she wrote, I would like to think about the engagement between the technology we're building and humans. So from 1815, as she's designing algorithms with her then um, research professor, this was already a topic of conversation. Then in 1958, we saw the perceptron by Frank Rosenblatt that really started looking at how do we design that neural network that actually looks like the human brain. Because this is what's funny, right? Humans are now still trying to really just assume that we are the smartest out there and we're actually constantly trying to build ourselves, which is interesting. And then after that, we saw the, the AI boom. This was a really exciting period. A lot of money went into research and development on AI. And then we obviously saw the AI winter because, you know, everything goes up and down. And then we saw the development of expert systems where for the first time, AI was being trained on expert thinking. So really, where we were starting to look at training AI as per an expert domain. Then we looked at the emergence of NLP and computer vision, which was now possible because all of a sudden we were sitting on so much more data. And that rise of big data continued, and we saw the things like Furbies. I don't know if you remember them. They were sold to retail like $20, and then all of a sudden, 400 And they were just learning all the stuff that your kids were saying to them to get better. And then we saw deep learning again, in part due to all this additional data that you know things like the Furbies had been collecting. And then we're here, like now-ish generative AI, which you've seen a lot of today as well, creating new stories, new strategies, new videos, new images. But that, that helps me because then I start to think, oh yeah, why this is all coming together and why this is such a big deal right now is because of these two things and because, well, enough of us have been playing with it for a while. And this all ties into where we are now as it relates to education. One of my favorite quotes is to teach kids to be different from machines. Because ultimately, it's not our job to act like machines. It's our job to be more human. It's our job to be able to connect. And I promised you at the beginning that I was going to break this down into some practical ways to think about the future of education in the Czech Republic, for example, if that's where you are from and to start distilling what this actually means for the 21st century, to make sense of what we've heard today. So in our case, we like to look at the 21st century skills. This is one of the frameworks. We use three frameworks. This is one of the three frameworks that we use to start thinking about what assessment and grading really means in the 21st century. It means thinking and learning to learn. Can you think? Can you actually think? You know, Ray this morning said that he tells his brain to solve a problem. I do the same. When I, before I go to sleep, if I have a problem, 
I tell my brain, okay, we need to solve this problem by 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. I kid you not, I do this. And then I wake up at like 3.50 or 4 a.m., it's like the creativity hour, and I write in my notebook I, how to solve that problem. I'm not kidding. But you, if you want to do this trick, by the way, you have to give your brain a deadline, because our brain is, otherwise, will we'll just take its time. So you need to say, by 9 a.m., tomorrow morning, I want this problem solved. So do you know how to train your brain and really rewire it? You know, we heard today that that's possible. It is also possible by consistent effort on your part. What's next that's really critical is cultural competence. You clapped when I said Dobri Den. Why? Because I'm connecting with you in your language. I'm culturally mindful. I want to be. If we look at self-care and managing everyday life, you know, there's so many jokes about how overwhelming the pandemic was and what self-care really is. Well, if we think about the fact that I know this firsthand, part of my team is in Mombasa, Mombasa, Kenya, and they actually had to build inverters from scratch because they don't always have electricity. My developers are based in Ukraine. So if I'm talking about self-care and managing everyday life, that's, that's heavy. That's the 21st century. That's just where we are right now. Multiliteracy, being able to communicate across, across multiple channels, understanding IT, understanding working life, not being afraid to roll up your sleeves, and participating in actually building that sustainable future. But we also look at things like the sustainable development goals. Why? Not necessarily because this is the be-all, end-all, but because it's a very useful framework to look at, okay, this is what our country is facing, this is what our kids need to learn to amalgamate and to actually understand how to operate in the world today. All right, let's use some of these. And the nice thing about this, there's always one or two that will speak to you. And finally, we use mindsets in a lot of our curricula design. So, you might recognize some of these if you're familiar with Peter Diamandis' work. Um, the three that I share with Peter the most are gratitude, curiosity, and purpose. And then Peter really appreciates moonshot, abundance, exponential, and longevity. And then I like love, surrender, and creativity. Especially as an entrepreneur and as an artist, those have helped me a lot. And since we know that answering normal questions for a test is no longer going to matter, what is going to matter? What's going to matter is our ability to get back up after a seriously bad situation happens. What is going to, be ma what's going to matter is the way in which we ask questions. Well, why is that happening? Who really did that? Is that source accurate? Why are those angels playing instruments up there? So which, what is the quality of the question that you're asking? And finally, what is your purpose? If you're going to get out of bed in 2023, what's your purpose? You better know yourself or you're going to be bored. And these are all things to take into consideration as you're redesigning an entire curricula for the future of your country. Now, the good news is you don't have to redesign this curricula in one go. I don't know exactly how it works in the Czech Republic. I have never been an active participant of your education system. But what I do know is that in some countries, educators will write a five-year plan. A five-year plan? For what? By tomorrow, the plan is outdated. You better get really good at understanding where you need to adjust. So don't get caught up in, okay, we need this curriculum from four years old to 18 years old. This is what our kids need to know. No, your kids need to learn how to be happy and healthy. And you design the structure around that, especially with the increase of use of technology. But it's not that easy. There's a lot of stuff that goes wrong. Things like data integration. We don't share openly best practices. We don't. That's where ego gets in the way. And it's really unfortunate because that's something people do that really doesn't help us. We're also running a little bit low on time and energy, and that makes sense. There's a lot of demand on the human body. There's fear of job replacement. I see this 50-50 um, in audiences, or 70-30, yeah, like that people really worry about job replacement, so I'll handle that as well. And we don't have clear strategies, especially in education. There's a big lack of just having a simple, clear strategy because there's no directive. 
So let's tackle some of these. First, say you work in education today. You want to understand how to actually now go, go back to your community, right? Any of you are in education, or even if you're in business, or if you're in learning and development, you've learned all this stuff today. How am I going to implement it? Three things you need to know. Business. Business needs to know how to talk about AI. Business needs to know how to talk about exponential technologies. That's your number one. Get those people upskilled. Number two, make sure that you have the right in-house technical team. My team is based out of Ukraine, as I already said. They're awesome. They're fantastic at machine learning. It took me a long time to find them. But it's very hard even to know which questions to ask. Are you technically well skilled enough to ask the right questions to even onboard the technologies that we've heard today? Be honest with yourself. It's one thing to conceptually understand it. But if you don't know the questions to ask about which models the team is using, toxicity meters, how they're going to store the data, where they're going to store the data, how are they going to scale, you're running into a lot of serious questions that you need to know in order to actually do any of this that we've been talking about. And finally, language. How are you communicating internally about this? Because it goes very quick that we lose each other. Especially in the education sector, all of that is underpinned by education, research, and operations. Education is how we're learning. The pedagogy, like I said, research is how are we staying up to date. And operations is actually how the school or institution runs. All right, so let's, let's break down the thing I said earlier about fear of jobs, okay? Many teachers, many, many people around the world worry that their job is going to go uh, and, and be lost to AI. First thing you want to do is do this. Break down a job into tasks. And what I mean with that is the following. You know that an AI can read a scan, right? A radiology scan. You, you know this. And you know that AI can often pick up on a certain cancer, for example, before a human can. Yes, you might have come across this research. Does that mean that AI can do the job of a radiologist? No because there are many tasks involved with being a radiologist. Those are speaking with colleagues, setting up the right meetings, going to research conferences, but most importantly, breaking terrible news to a patient. So start by breaking down jobs into tasks when you think about what are the skills that my kids really need to know in the future. Then. See if that task can be augmented by artificial intelligence or if it can be automated. Augmented simply means that it's going to be slightly assisted by, and automated means it's going to be taken over by. And you must do this for yourself as well. You can automate things like your scheduling, but you might just want to augment your, your uh, Microsoft Copilot, right, to help you with your presentations. Your human brain is still needed. And finally, you assess the value of doing this. So could I have an avatar come in and talk to you today about AI and education? Sure. Do I think that that's valuable? No, I don't. I'd rather be here with you today. So assess the value of all that. That's very simple, three steps for you to take if you start worrying about AI taking your jobs or not understanding where work is going to be in a couple of years. And side note, 60% of the jobs that we have today were not around in the 1940s. So the chances that we're going to be fine. I learned some of this from Andrew. You might recognize him. He's awesome. I met him at a conference last year, but was too shy to take a picture. But so I had to take that one from the internet. Um, an example with programmers. If you think that you know, AI could do the job of a programmer, for example, yeah, it could do you know, three or five, three or four, out, five out of these things, but not everything. So I, I bring all this up, you know, and I always think about the Greeks and how they taught and they would sit under these trees and have conversations and ask, you know, what does it mean to be a good person? How do I want to show up in the world today? The really good questions. Um, so I wanted to bring up this last example in Greece where you obviously have heard of Turing. And so the Turing trap really is about this automation versus augmentation idea. If you herded sheep and then you automated that process, right? Imagine the Greeks had this technology that could do this. They didn't have to herd sheep anymore. They didn't have to do any clay pottery. They didn't have to weave tunics. It was all automated for them. 
But what's the problem with this? The problem is that innovation stops. So you don't actually do yourself a favor by really automating everything, because it just stops. So be smart about what you're automating in your schools and what you're augmenting in your schools. A couple of case studies. Uh, here's a case study in the University of Florida where they're really looking at how are we going to implement AI across our entire curricula. Their ambition is to lead in AI for all their programs, and they do that by making sure that their students are upskilled enough. Here's a case study of a university in which I'm, work, uh, which I'm working with in the Netherlands itself. We're actually looking at breaking down a lot of this information into strategic steps that every educational institution can follow. And we're doing really great work with another school as well, where we're actually building these AI mentors for them so that every single student has their own teacher. Why? Well, this is a really interesting case. Some of these students are going to be in careers that require them to work with their hands, uh, maybe work in a shop, maybe work as a driver. There are different types of careers in this particular school. And what I love about this is that these kids, a lot of it is mindset. A lot of it is psychological. So everything that we're building in is about really being able to handle what's ahead of them that day. And that's where we're seeing the biggest difference, integrating all of that into the regular curricula. And if it reduces teacher time by over one hour and 15 minutes a day so that teachers can actually do what they want to do, which is connect with students, mentor students, and be there for them. So if you look at it, our, our platform is very simple, but it works across multiple devices and ultimately takes into consideration a few very important points. A fluid curricula so that you're never stuck with outdated curricula. It grows with the student. It takes into consideration mindset, real life projects. The AI mentor doesn't make the student do everything online. It says, go for a walk. Are you feeling stressed? Listen to some music. Call your mom. Teaching kids to deal with stress in different ways. And also, it doesn't allow them or doesn't ask them just to type answers because we know that that's not good enough, because we already know that AI can detect that. So we need to get better at asking the right questions. As a leader, your job right now is to do six things, OK? Understand future skills. It's really important that you understand what these are, because they're going to be a framework in which you can constantly move towards a future of work. Get clear on tasks. A task is not a job, and a task you can break down and automate or augment according to the technologies that you learned about today. Go at your own pace. This can be, it's a very fast moving space. You will never, you'll never keep up, you'll never get close. So just go at your own pace, don't stop learning. Upskill your employees, upskill yourself, and keep breathing. Actually, really keep breathing, okay? Because let me even show you this. If you tell an AI model to take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step, if that's how you start your prompt, it gets the highest score. Finally, you may want to just grab this last piece of information. This is going to be important as well. It's pretty tricky to keep up with the regulations. Either way, this technology is coming into our spaces. What I wanted to do for you today was provide some practical frameworks in which you can start thinking about having conversations with the teachers at the schools that your kids are currently attending to make sure that they're educated in the right way at the right time. Thank you. Yes, many thanks. Absolutely. Great talk. And Amazing overview, also the different national contexts, and I very much value your ability to focus on the Czech context as well, because that's rare and exactly as you said, it's part of the enculturation. We heard a lot of, about a lot of benefits that there are. Um, the question that I have for you is the prospective dark side, advanced personalized personalized education using AI to track learning patterns, the very subject, also involves trove of personalized data. And this data is 
potentially very worthy for many reasons. And I'm not talking about theft related to credit card numbers, but we're talking about kids, we're talking about students, we're talking about their histories, their individual learning patterns being somewhere out there stored. Less than a month ago, they tell 2.6 million Duolingo users were stolen. How would you convince me as a parent that data security of our minors has been the top priority of the segment? Floor's yours. It's so funny. We've been hearing Nick's questions all day, and we're like, oh my God, what is he going to ask us when we get up there? I love your question, and you're right. Like, it's, 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 it's a great question, and it's a serious consideration. So how I think about it is the following. I can speak from the perspective of what we are doing, which is that we cannot see which students said what. Mm -hmm. All of it stays within the educational institution. So regardless of what's happening, it's not on our platform, and we made that choice consciously so as to never be the ones owning the data. The second thing that we built in, and again, I'll speak from our perspective and then you know, more holistically, is that until a student is ready to be graded or until a student is ready for their grade or their comment to be seen, it's just them and the AI mentor. They have to click a button that gives that permission for their um, answer to be shared. It's very, every, there are so many data breaches, you mm -hmm. know, and there's a wonderful speaker um, who discusses this uh, security topic as, as her area of expertise. I would go in knowing that no matter what happens on the internet, we have actually, there's, there is always room for compromise. There's also room for compromise if you step out on the street. Mm -hmm. Um, what you want to make sure is that you're vetting your products before you implement them in your business. Mm -hmm. And like I said at the beginning, do you actually have the technical skills to vet whether or not the supplier that you're bringing on can actually maintain the integrity of your data? Obviously, when it comes to under 18, there are additional guidelines that we need to follow, which is why I emphasized at the end of the presentation as well, the EU Digital Act, which of course, suppliers like ourselves, but all the other education suppliers have to be very mindful of as well. How big would be a voluntary action for the segment possibly to come with a set of voluntary principles or standard, the benchmark? You haven't had that for personalized education, that you wouldn't be necessarily waiting for the European Union to put in place legislation, but possibly, I, I guess there would be a good branding for a company really involved in personalized education using AI tools would be to say, look, these are our standards and possibly exactly what your answer has been. The st our standards are higher than of our competitors. Maybe the leading edge part of the branding strategy would be the answer as well. I don't necessarily want to say anything is better or worse. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that this is an un largely also still an unexplored territory, but the integrity of anybody working in this space at least the way I see it, is that it is our prime objective to make sure mm -hmm. that that data is safe, yeah. that student answers are safe. Can you ever guarantee the safety of everything in life? No, but that's not really, that's a discussion that you know, we can't close today. But what we can do is say, well, these are all the guidelines. This is literally what we have to uphold mm -hmm. according to the EU regulations. There's no way around that. Um, but I wouldn't see it as a branding exercise. It's an integrity exercise. It's a guideline exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with many educational products um, for kids, and we always started with working with the United Nations Declaration of the, the Right of the Child, because ultimately that's the, the child as the main body that is consuming or engaging with whatever it is you're teaching them. The difference between AI is that it's now at scale. And that's a really big difference. Um, but that content has always been in the world already. That was yours, Dirks. Many thanks. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. your great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.